Thank you for tuning in to Bridge Bible Church's stream. This week, I just want to say that we have a prayer focus, and that is our 1016 team. Many of you know we have a team that is uh, commissioned to reach Muslims in Southeast Asia. Currently, they are home because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and they're trying to reorganize and figure out what's next. Their goal is to return to Southeast Asia sometime in October, and we want to pray for them. And we want to pray that God will give them clear direction, an opening to return, and also receptive hearts when they get there. Also, I just want to say, if you want all the latest updates that we have to offer at Bridge Bible Church, please uh, download our app or go to our website. And also, too, we post as much as we can on social media. Last thing I just want to remind you of is that uh, this week and next week, we will be worshiping in the evening at the Hill Church. And our plan is to make some kind of an announcement in the near future uh, about some kind of a return to Sunday morning. So please be praying for us that these details can work out. So with that in mind, let's pray for the 1016 team, and let's pray that God will provide a clear path to returning to Sunday mornings to worship together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for all those at home that are uh, seeing this video and joining and participating with Bridge Bible Church this way. I pray, God, that you would bring this virus to a halt so that we could all return worshiping together. And Lord, that you would protect those that have decided to stay home from any kind of illness and that uh, their mind, body, and spirit would thrive while they're at home. Lord, we do pray that we could return to a Sunday morning worship and that you would either open the school or provide a space for us to claim as our own where we can remain set up for a while. And Lord, we do pray too that you would provide for our building funds so that we could pay off the land and start construction uh, in the very near future. That is our heart's desire. Lord, for our 1016 team, we just ask that you would be with uh, those, those guys that we support and their wives and their kids. And I pray that you would provide a clear path for them moving forward, that they continue uh, to reach those that are far from God in Southeast Asia. We love them. We care deeply for them. And we're so thankful that you provide direction in their lives. Uh, with this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to Knowing the battles won, for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in.
your word will come to pass my heart will sing your praise again Jesus you're still
the right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Thank you for tuning in for week three of our series called Fake News and Bad Bible Teaching. The familiar phrase that we're going to evaluate, scrutinize, and possibly myth bust is the phrase, money is the root of all evil. How many of you heard that before? That money is the root of all evil. Now let's interpret that just for a moment so that we understand what's actually being said. We're, we're saying an inanim inanimate object has the human quality of evil. Or some say it this way, money is corrupts. And so what that shows me is there's often a belief among people that, that we're worried about the evil that's out there while neglecting that's e the evil that's in here, the human heart. Uh, a long time ago, I was selling this car when I was living in Canton. And the car was a decent car, but it was time to get something that was going to last me a little longer, have a few less repairs. And uh, I met this gentleman, he drove the car, uh, and he asked me what I did for a living. And I told him, and he went on to just complain about all the evils of the world today and ask me how I do what I do with the evils in the world today and how do I raise kids with the evil in the world today. The next day when we were doing the title transfer, we're standing in line and he whispers at me. He said, hey, can you tell them I'm only paying a few hundred dollars for this car? And I looked at him just astonished. I was like, no. He said, come on, man, that would really help me out. I said, dude, you were just telling me yesterday about all the evils in the world. And I had shared with you that the only remedy was Jesus Christ. But right now, you're not even worried about the evil that's in your own heart. So we got to the, ca the counter and I believe that he was going to try to beat me to the punch. And before the lady at the counter or the gentleman next to me said anything, I blurted out the cost of the car, uh, filled it out on the form, signed it, asked if I was done, took his money and left. And I was just dumbfounded that this gentleman so worried about the evil out there was willing to ignore the evil in here. See, hearing the phrase money is the root of all evil should naturally lead us to ask a very important question. If money is so bad, why hasn't this stopped us from wanting it? Many of you have kids or grandkids, and a lot of times they'll ask you for money. Sometimes they want a burrito, so they want to go to Chipotle. That's what teenagers do here in Brimfield, and, and that's what they did at Maranatha when I worked there. And uh, they, they want to take your money so that Chipotle can take your money. See, Chipotle is not giving out burritos out of the kindness of their hearts. They're not saying, oh, we don't want that money. We don't want that evil in here. Here's your burrito. Have a nice day. Apple or Android, they're not producing phones out of a desire to be kind and altruistic. We just want you to be connected. No, they want your money. None of us have gone to a job interview where the interviewer said, hey, there's no pay for this job because we're trying to protect you from that evil known as money. Doing this job is reward in and of itself. I can guarantee you that if most of us went to that interview, we would say, thank you very much for your time. Don't call me. I'll call you. So it's an irony that those that believe money is the root of all evil likely haven't stopped wanting it or trying to obtain it because you need a certain amount of it just to make it in our society. So the next problem we come to is that this phrase as presented to you today is not even in the Bible. The closest variant of this phrase is found in 1 Timothy 6.10. So before we jump into that phrase, we have to ask some questions. Who is the author of the variant of that phrase? Who are the original hearers? Or was there an original hearer that the author was writing to? Is this true fake news or somewhere in between? And the last question we want to tackle is what does the Bible teach on money and wealth. So with that, let's start with the easier questions. Uh, this is 1 Timothy 6.10 is kind of our main text, but we're going to look at some verses around it. But we find at the beginning of the book, 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, that the human author is in fact the Apostle Paul, the same Apostle Paul whom we talked about last week. The original hearers, or hearer in this case, is Timothy. We find that in 1 Timothy 1.2. And through careful Bible study, we learn that Timothy is a young pastor that Paul had discipled and had great affection for. He often referred to Timothy as his true son in the faith, and he writes very affectionately uh, words to guard his ministry, to guard his life, and also uh, to help him guard the people that Timothy is ministering to. Now, let's ask this question, is this true, fake news, or somewhere in between? Well, for starters, it's a misquote. 
We read in 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So notice a couple things. Uh, the phrase love of money eradicates the notion that money in and of itself is evil. There's a, there's a way to love money that leads to all kinds of evil. So loving money isn't an evil in and of itself. You could probably love money and have it in right priority, uh, but we're going to get to that as we move on. So let's talk for a minute just about the fuller context that this, this passage finds itself in. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, Paul is actually writing to Timothy about the marks of a false teacher. Uh, in verse 4a, we learn about their attitude. We find out that false teachers are conceited. They're puffed up. They're arrogant. They think there's nothing wrong with them and what they want, and there's only wrong with everyone else. We find in uh, verse 4b, uh, their level of understanding. Paul actually says they understand nothing. In verses 4c through 5a, we find their effects. They cause envy. They cause strife. They use abusive language. And they create constant friction in the churches that they're leading and deceiving. We see in verse 5b, there's a cause for these false teachers that they still have a depraved mind. They have not been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. They are not true Jesus followers. Their heart has not been transformed. And their thoughts are following their heart. We find their condition in verse 5c. They are deprived of the truth. The truth of the gospel is not in them. In verse 5d, we see their motives. And here's the deal. They see godliness as a means of financial gain. Now, I don't often do this. I don't often promote books. But I got my hands on this book called God, Greed, and the Prosperity Gospel by Kosti Hinn. He gives an inside look to what's going on behind the scenes, the things they teach, the ways they live, and the way they try to keep the money pouring in. And they present themselves as godly people, as prophets of God in some cases, and they're actually just using it to fill their pocketbook. And then finally, we come to verses 6 through 10. And Paul talks about the dangers of loving money. So we're going to read that text, and then we're going to ask the question, what's really being said here? So picking up in verse 6, I'm reading from the ESV. Uh, you can join me on the screen, or you can read from your copy of God's Word at home, whether digital or hard copy. But godliness, in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Does not sound fun. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Lots going on here. So let's break this down verse by verse together. In verse 6, we see godliness being combined with contentment. And, and Paul is saying, this is where great ga gain occurs. See, Paul is writing in, the, in a contrasting way with the false teachers that he had just talked about. These false teachers merely appear to be godly. They're not content. They're actually greedy and full of evil. And they use that appearance to become wealthy. And, and the comparison is being made between them and true Christians who actually truly desired godliness. And if you desire godliness in your content, that's a great recipe. In fact, if you're looking at a pastor or a teacher, maybe a good question to ask about their spiritual condition is what is their attitude towards wealth? Do they themselves seem greedy or are they godly and content? See, true godliness provides contentment in an individual, but also spiritual riches. And this occurs because a true Christian will find their satisfaction in God and not in the things that God created. Now, there's this, this old tale of a healing of a cripple. It comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 4 and 6. Peter and John encounter this cripple who's begging, and they, they say to him, Listen, silver and gold have I none, but rise and walk. And so they, they heal this man, demonstrating the power of God, proclaiming the gospel. Now, later on, there's this story being told by a Jesu Jesuit priest named Cornelius A. Lapide, and he, he talks about this encounter between Thomas Aquinas and Pope Innocent II. And Pope Innocent II is counting this large sum of money. The church had become rich. See, we had very, very poor roots. People came to Jesus. Some rich people came to Jesus and became very generous. And you saw generosity as a mark uh, of the early church. Well, later on, uh, as he's counting this money, Pope Innocent II says to Thomas, he says, You see, Thomas, the church can no longer say, Silver and gold have I none. And, and Thomas responded in a very poignant way. He says, True, Holy Father, 
neither can she now say rise and walk. And this is kind of an anecdotic tale of what can happen to a group of Christians that experience long-term prosperity. Their priority uh, is diminished. Their spiritual power is gone. And it becomes about money and not about ministry. And so as this is being written and talked about, this is not a rip on the Catholic Church. It's just a warning of what can happen when the desire for wealth creeps in. Contentment is very important. Looking at verse 7, we see Paul remind us of the temporal nature of wealth and possessions. And this kind of echoes something Jesus says about laying up your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves can break in and steal. Well, with that, even if that doesn't happen in our lifetime, Paul reminds us that we brought nothing into the world and we're not taking anything with us. See, we have seen funeral uh, processions in our culture. None of them have the hearse toting a U-Haul behind it. And you see these weird things in culture that kind of like is an echo of the ancient Egyptians that wanted to have their wealth and possessions buried with them so they could have them in the afterlife. People want to be buried with their cars or something that means a lot to them. Well, the the truth is you're not going to take anything from this life with you. Everything that you amass that's a physical thing in this life is temporal. Now, with that in mind, I grew up with a youth pastor who was very wise to this. And he used to say to us all the time, two things last forever, God's word and people. And he reminded us to invest in those things, invest in things that eternal and not in things that are temporal. Now, in verse 8, Paul gives a very clear instruction that, that Christians should be content when our needs are met. He says, but if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. And it's important to us if our needs are met and we have shelter and God continuously and miraculous ways provides for what we need when we need it, we should be content and thankful. See, there's a passage that that talks about not being blessed to the point where we forget our need for God, but also not being so poor that we curse God. Now, when I was a ministry uh, candidate in college, I was surrounded by other ministry candidates and they would say things like this. Well, you know, God's going to bless me with a BMW because I want to minister to rich people. And so the question would often formulate in my head when I hear these ridiculous statements is, do you want to really take the gospel to the rich? Because that's a challenging thing. They don't think they need God if they're far from God and they're wealthy. Or do you just want to have a very affluent lifestyle? In fact, the reason that question kept jumping into my mind is I was ministering to one of the guys in my small group. Uh, he was a he was a young high school kid at the time, and uh, his family was part of the Fortune 500, the 500 richest families in America. And I want to tell you that in ministering to this kid, God did not provide me with a BMW. He actually provided me with a beat up 88 Mazda that my brother had to install a CD player that sometimes didn't work into. And we had great times. We had great spiritual conversations. He had a lot of spiritual breakthroughs uh, between uh, the way uh, we were hanging out and our small group was growing together and the way the church was ministering to him and his family. And, And it didn't happen because I had a rich guy's car. So we need to be content when our needs are met. Paul reminds us in verse 9 that the desire to be wealthy can be a trap. See, an unhealthy desire to be wealthy leads to what we call misplaced devotion. Another word for that is worship. When our worship is misplaced, when we're ascribing greater worth to things other than Jesus, uh, the strong rebuke for that is recognizing that that's idolatry, that you're putting something else before God. Now, think about this just for a minute. The pangs and the pains that people have brought on themselves from this desire to be wealthy. Some have sacrificed their health. They're not sleeping enough. They're not eating right. They're not exercising. It's all about earning that almighty dollar. Some have sacrificed time with their loved ones, whether it's their parents, their kids, their wives. Because of that, some of them have alienated themselves from those relationships, lost their marriage, had no influence on their kids. Their kids grew up without that that parent, could be male or female, uh, that was pouring so much into work that they weren't pouring anything in at home. And, and some has gone as far as to sacrifice their integrity. They've lied, they've cheated, they've stealed to make money. So the desire to be wealthy can lead to all kinds of problems. And Paul warns us of that in that text. He's warning Timothy of that. And by extension, all Christians need to heed that warning. Now, think about this. Think about those that fell into wealth unintentionally, that weren't prepared to handle it. How many people have we read about that have won big jackpots and those big jackpots led to the ruining of their life or the ruining of the lives of their loved ones? Because all of a sudden, all the restraints are gone and they don't know how to manage all this wealth that has come in. In verse 10, we we find that the love of money has actually led to some leading the faith. 
And, and think about this. Some leave overtly. They turn their back on Jesus. They say, you know what? I don't want to give to the church. I don't want to worship this God. I want to do my own thing. And I want to make my life good. Some have remained. So, some have remained as false teachers, pretending to be godly, pretending to share the truth, but their true desire to be wealth is to be wealthy. And some have remained because there's something they're getting out of their relationship with the church, whether it's business contacts, political contacts, or influence in their community. So we need to recognize that the desire to be wealth, wealthy can lead people away from God. Now, Jesus himself warned us about this. There's this parable in Matthew chapter 13 that I, I absolutely love because it helps us understand who is saved and who's not. And Jesus tells this parable called the parable of the sower. It talks about this farmer that's sowing seed and the seed is the word of God and the word of God lands on these different types of soils and the different types of soils represent the different kinds of hearts that the word of God encounters. The first one is the path. There's no penetration of the seed into the path. The heart is so hard, it does not hear the gospel. The second is the rocky soil. And what that means is the soil is so full of rocks that, that when the seed hits it, it starts to sprout, but it's not get a strong root. And then when persecution comes, a person falls away from faith. Well, that person was never really a follower. It's not like they lost their salvation. The third type of soil uh, is the, the thorny soil, the, the soil with the weeds and the, the thistles. And, and Jesus describes that type of soil is the kind of heart that's distracted by the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world. And because of that, they, they seem to gr be growing a faith. And then all of a sudden, those desires choke out their faith. And again, Jesus isn't saying those desires cause them to lose their faith. It just revealed that they never had faith. And then the last soil is the good soil that when the seed hits it, not only does it grow a plant, but it produces fruit 50, 25, or 10 times what was sown. So Jesus warned us that the deceitfulness of riches would keep people from him. So the question we have to wrangle with as we understand what Paul is saying, he never says money is in and of itself evil. In fact, all through the, go all through the Gospels, we learn about generous people supporting Jesus' ministry. We learn about generous people supporting Paul's ministry. We learn about generous offerings that go back to churches facing persecution. So money can be used in a way that glorifies God. Well, what we need to understand is Hebrews 13.5 the author reminds us, he says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. So that's a great mindset to have, whether we're rich, poor, or somewhere in between. We need to be content. And one of the ways we be content is to worship and be thankful to, to God for what we have. Now, let me give you some other keys to contentment as we find in Scripture. And here's the first one. Don't let money become an idol. We read uh, that in Colossians 3, 5, Paul says, put to death, therefore, what is whatever is earthly in you. Now, he mentions a couple things, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So, so don't want things so bad or want money so bad that you put it as an idol in your life. And, and, and anything can be an idol. It's anything that you put as more important than God. A second uh, way to remain content is remember this truth from Luke 12, 15, that life is more than material possessions. See, the sum of your life is not the things that you gather as you go into retirement and ultimately into the grave. Jesus says in this verse, he says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. We've heard this word before. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Think about all the other aspects of life, walking with God, serving Jesus with purpose, serving your church as a form of serving Jesus, your relationship, uh, all those kinds of things help bring about a full and meaningful life, but it has to start with pleasing God and making sure that we're not making life all about our possessions. We read in Matthew 19, 24, that wealth can be a stumbling block to someone being saved. There's a story of this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and, and Jesus says, hey, if you want to follow me, sell all you have, give it to the poor and uh, come and follow me. And he goes away sad because he loves his possessions. And Jesus says in response to that, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And, and some people misinterpret that and think that the needle's eye is a gate in the city. That's not true. It's a tiny needle and a big camel. And they're like, well, how do you get the camel through that needle? Uh, you, you can't. Even if you grease the camel and shove hard, it's not going to happen. The point is, it's impossible for someone who loves money more than Jesus to be saved. We also read in Scripture in places like Proverbs 13, 22, 
that if you have extra and excess, it's good to plan for the future. Uh, Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, some of us are unable to do that. And that's not an indictment on us. This is actually written to those that have wealth, and this is a wise way to use wealth if you have it. Hebrews 13, 16 reminds us, sharing your wealth pleases God. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, I want to just share a little bit about my background. I grew up in a church where there are many generous people. There's a lot of times I couldn't have afforded to go on the trips, uh, the youth outings, uh, the conferences, and all these things that that God had used to, to help grow my faith if there wasn't generous people in the church because sometimes my family just didn't have it. Now, as I grew up, I used to think, man, I want to be wealthy like these people so that I can help others. And what I realized as I got older is, you know what? I don't have to be wealthy to share. I just have to be willing to make a sacrifice because it pleases God when we sacrifice for others. And the last thing I think is a kind of a key to contentment, uh, and this is an important teaching from Jesus, is that your heart actually follows your money. And we get that backwards in our culture. We think, well, we'll give to the causes that we're passionate about. Well, that's not always true. In fact, sometimes if we want to develop a greater passion, we should give to something and then our heart will follow. Uh, Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 21. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where you're putting your money, your heart will follow. So I just want to say, if you want to care more about the poor, or you want to care more about missions, or you want to care about the local church, or maybe you want to care more about Bridge Bible Church getting a building, uh, give to those things. There's plenty of good things to give to. Now, I just want to share with you. One time um, I gave to some, some cause out there. And then what happened was every time that cause hit the news, my ears perked up. And I was interested in what was going on because I had given some money to that. Many of you that have investments know what that's like. If you have investments, all of a sudden your ears perk up when you hear news about the stock market. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I want to give you one other question that I don't know if we covered, is how should we approach money as Christians? Well, the way we approach money as Christians is we remember this truth. Money can be a great servant, but it's a lousy master. If your desire is to just earn and earn and earn and uh, obtain and gather and increase, and that is your desire. You become a slave to that desire, and that will destroy your life. But if you're a person who can be content with what you have, and as God blesses you, you have the mindset, you're going to bless others. Money can be a great servant. So here's how you make money your servant. Here's the first thing. Pay your bills. You've got to pay your bills. It does not honor God when you don't pay your bills. Secondly, you need to uh, make sure that you are giving to local causes that you care about, specifically the church. Our, our, our first act of worship with money should be to the church that ministers to us that we worship at. Thirdly, you should keep some extra, maybe to share with others. We should not be hoarders or, or, or protecting what we have at the expense of others. And finally, as you have extra, use that to plan for the future. Use your money wisely. Now, with that in mind, if you are struggling with money right now, especially with all that's going on with COVID-19 and people losing their jobs and, and people's unemployment running out, we want you to know the local church is here to help you. Our deacons have some money at their disposal to meet physical needs. And also, too, we have some very, very crafty deacons that are very, very aware of the social services out there and have helped people in the past connect to get the help they need. So I want you to know, if you need help and you're hearing all this about money and you're, you're thinking, dude, you don't understand what we're going through, to some level I do. I grew up that way. And I want you to know our church's heart is that we're here to help. But also, too, if you're a person who says, you know what? I need help managing my finances. Maybe maybe I, it looks like I should have enough. Well, we have people that can lead you through things uh, like financial peace or just budgeting uh, so that you can become a better steward with God, what God has given you. See, the final verdict should be this. Worship God only. Use money as a way to glorify Him. And I don't just mean what you give to others. The way you prioritize your finances is a way to show God 
that he is number one in your life. The way you use uh, money to go out to eat and how often you go out to eat, the way you use money uh, to buy uh, things that you uh, desire, things that you like, or, or the way you use money uh, to, to spend on hobbies and all those kinds of things. If you put that in the right priority and you put Jesus first, money becomes a mean of glorifying God because money is not an evil in and of itself. Money is merely a tool in the hands of either godly men or wicked men. And depending who's using it, that's what determines what impact money will have. I just want to say thank you for tuning in. Uh, as, as I said, if you have a need, we want to meet that need. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your truth. And we thank you that you gave us all these warnings about money and how it can kind of creep in and, and become an idol in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would guard our hearts from that. Lord, I know there are many in our church uh, experiencing financial need at this time. I ask that you'd provide for them. I ask that whether it's through the church whether it's through government agencies or even just the generosity of individuals, that everyone in our church family would have their needs met. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone that's afraid to bring their need to the church, I pray, God, that you'd speak to their heart and let them know that people in our church love them dearly and want to help. Lord, for the rest of us uh, that, that would have enough if we budgeted right or, or even need to be faithful in glorifying you with what we have, I pray, God, that that would be our commitment, that we would show you that you are number one, and that we would recognize that the evil is not out there, but it's in the human heart. And the remedy for that evil is Jesus Christ. Thank you for our church family. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bridge Bible Church, you are sent. Go be a blessing.
bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. Oh, the wonderful cross. Oh, the wonderful cross. All who gather here by grace draw near and bless your